As we get started today, I need a little bit of help with uh, developing an image for us. If I say to you, a boy, what age am I talking about? 10, 9, teenager. We settled on between 8 and 12 this morning, which was 10, so go 10. Now, I want you to imagine that as we were beginning worship, a 10-year-old walked up here and said, this is the word of the Lord, and unloaded some biblical prophecy on you. What would we say? Oh, dear. Maybe that's adorable. That's nice, right? Would we take that 10-year-old seriously as a prophet bringing us a word from the Lord? Probably not. This is the story of Jeremiah. God calls to Jeremiah and says, you're going to be a prophet. And Jeremiah says, I'm just a boy. What I think Jeremiah is saying is, come on, who's going to take me seriously? He knows, right? He's young, and people are going to say he doesn't have an experience. He doesn't know anything. How, you know, we got learned people that have spent their whole lives studying this. What does he know? Moses, when he's standing at the burning bush, God says, you are going to go lead my people out of Israel. And he says, what's your name? Because if I don't know what your name is, who's going to pay attention to me? And God says, I am who I am, which is not the best answer to take back. Uh, and then later Moses says, well, I have a speech impediment, right? Moses is really saying, who's going to take me seriously if I can't tell them who sent me and I can't clearly speak to them? Because Moses didn't live in an age where there was like uh, uh, assessment of people's differing abilities and trying to make space for people. Fast forward to the resurrection. The women come back from the tomb and they say, Jesus is risen. And what do the rest of the disciples say? Okay. Right? Why? Because they're women. So in the biblical narrative, we find people who are not taken seriously or don't expect to be taken seriously because they're women, because they're young, because they have differing abilities. There's also plenty of stories where people aren't taken seriously in that their predicament or their circumstances aren't taken seriously. So when Jesus is in the temple on the Sabbath or in the synagogue and the religious leaders know he's going to heal someone, they're like, hold on, it's the Sabbath. They don't think those people's pain and suffering is as urgent as Jesus does. They're not taking those situations seriously. I share all of this because I think we probably have all experienced not being taken seriously. When I was an information technology consultant, my first several projects I was on, I got asked the same question every time. And that question was, how old are you? I was 22, I looked like I was 15, I showed up in somebody's office to redesign their job when they got a master's degree. Even when I was a pastor, so I had nine years of IT, five years of seminary, I'd been a pastor almost five years, I was 41 years old, both my parents were already dead, right, like I have done a little bit of living, and I had a woman come to my office and say, Pastor, can I talk to you? And I said, sure, and she said, you know, I got a death in the family, and we've got some interesting dynamics. We had a wonderful conversation, and before she left, she said, I almost didn't come talk to you. And I said, really? And why was the reason? Still too young, right? And so, like, I've had all through my life, right, this thing of struggling sometimes to be taken seriously. And I would bet most of us have experienced that, whether because of our age, whether because of our gender or our ability or our experience. Sometimes some of you are really funny and people struggle to take it seriously because they think you're always joking, right? Anybody ever go to the doctor and tell the doctor, I know what's going on, I got this pain, that pain, and the doctor not take it seriously? I had a patient when I was in uh, CPE working in the hospital as a chaplain. They'd been to five hospitals. She knew her daughter had an appendix problem. Five hospitals where they said, Nah, and then her appendix finally burst and she almost died. It was a Mennonite woman. So I don't know if it was her religion, if it was her being a woman. What was it that they couldn't take her seriously? So sometimes us not being taken seriously is just frustrating because we're at work and we have an idea or a solution to the problem and people aren't taking that seriously. But sometimes it can really be life or death if people don't take us seriously. Now before I'm too hard on people not taking us seriously, 
Sometimes we're not taking other people seriously. A few years ago, we had to have somebody paint our house. It was in really bad condition in terms of paint and cracks and the, everything. And three people came out. Two came in athletic shorts, sloppy t-shirts, tennis shoes, and hair that was a little messy. One came in freshly pressed pants, a jacket with the company logo, and a hat with the company logo. Which did we take most seriously? The third one, right? I almost didn't even want to talk to the other two, which they could have been the best one, right? Just I'm judging by external circumstances on whether or not I'm going to take them serious. One of them took a phone call in the middle of our chat, proceeded to walk out to my sidewalk and use a lot of cuss words to talk about a Haitian woman whose house he was painting. There was not a chance he was painting my house. But right, there's judgments we make as we try to figure out, which tells us that what sits underneath this idea of whether or not we are taken seriously or we take other people seriously is a question of trust. When I showed up in somebody's cube and they're like, who's this kid? They're trying to decide, can I trust him with my job and what we have to do right now? When Jeremiah showed up with the word from the Lord, can we trust that this young kid here is speaking to us? When I'm looking at somebody to paint my house, can I trust that they're actually going to do a good job and show up and do what they say they're going to do and actually have the skill to do it well? I think underneath all of that are questions of trust. And when we don't have that trust, when we think we can't take someone seriously or they are not taking us seriously, a gap comes between us, right? There's something then of a chasm that forms where we're not fully connected as people. Today we hear another challenging parable from Jesus. This one starts off with a rich man who is very rich. He eats sumptuously every day. And even in Jesus' day, when they would have heard this parable, they would have went like, wow, that's a lot, right? And then, if you pay attention to parables, the characters in them almost never have names. What's the name of the father and the prodigal son? Father, right? What's the name of the son? Son. What's the name of the other one? Older brother. Rarely in parables do people have names, but Lazarus has a name. So as Jesus continues to tell the parable, and I don't know if this is a manual for what the afterlife looks like with the Hades and the burning flames. I suspect not because it's a parable. But as the story goes on and they're in this afterlife place, because we know his name, when the rich man says to Abraham, send Lazarus over, we now know that he doesn't have an excuse. He can't say, oh, I didn't know there was someone laying at my gate that was poor. I always go in and out of the back door. Because he looks and says, Abraham, send Lazarus over here. We now know that he intentionally did not help Lazarus, who he saw, laying at his gate. But this is the thing. You can tell that, A, he didn't take the, the struggle of Lazarus seriously, because he didn't do anything about it. But he still does not take Lazarus seriously as a human sibling, right, as a child of God. Because as he's in this place of struggle and suffering, he looks at Abraham and says, Please send Lazarus over to quench my thirst, right? Make him into my servant. He doesn't take Lazarus seriously yet. And then he says, oh, well, if you can't do that, at least send Lazarus, as like serving me again, to my brothers to warn them. And this is where we get a little bit of a twist in the story. Abraham says, well, they should know because they have Moses and the prophets. And the rich man basically says, come on, nobody takes that seriously. I sure didn't, and they won't either. So send someone who has been raised from the dead like Lazarus, and then they'll pay attention. Which tells us that this little bit of a parable is in part about whether or not the rich man was taking Lazarus seriously, but more so maybe it's about whether or not he was taking God seriously. Because in Jesus' time, their scripture, which we call the Hebrew scriptures, right, full of stories of God saying, care for people who are poor, care for the orphans, care for the widows, care for the immigrants among you. Over and over, God expresses all of this stuff. So when the rich man ignores Lazarus and doesn't do any of that, and then comes to this place where there's this chasm between them, it's a chasm of his own creating, and it came because he didn't take seriously 
the commands of God. Now, this is a parable, which means it's a story, but we have another text today that is that same parable but lived out in real life. In Amos, we hear, as we did from last week, from the prophet Amos, and the prophet is speaking about the way that the people of Israel are treating the poor people around them. Last week, what we heard was, you've rigged the scales in the markets so that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, and you treat the poor as if they're worth just a pair of sandals. This week, we get a different extension of that, and it's one of my favorite sort of ways that the biblical text speaks to us. It has a word, alas. Do any of you use that in your day-to-day speech? I think I'm going to try. So, um, but it starts off, alas. So you know there's like an announcement that is about to happen. Alas, you who sleep on ivory beds, you who eat of all the different kinds of meats from the flocks and the herds, you who drink wine out of bowls and sit around and play improvised music like David did. So this means they're just sitting around, partying, lounging around, and just making up songs like they're having a great time. It's alas, alas, but then comes therefore. Therefore, you will be the first to go into exile. Now for them, exile would be a very real thing of people getting deported out of the land that they knew, out of the homes that they knew, away from the temple that they knew. What I think Amos is saying is, you have not taken God seriously, so you've created a structure, a society full of chasms between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, the people that have power in the temple and those that don't. And so, because you've created a structure that isn't in line with God's vision for life, probably things aren't going to go well, and you're going to end up in exile. And that's exactly what happened. The Babylonians come. First, the Assyrians come and take some people away. Then the Babylonians come and do several rounds of deportations as well. Now, if I was an emperor, and I was conquering a neighboring land, and I was going to take some people out, the first people I would take are the ones who have shown a capability of organization and leadership. Why? Because they could organize and lead rebellion and resistance. So let's take them out the way. The next thing I would take is the business people who have demonstrated a capacity for making money and right, growing businesses. Why? Because they also can organize and lead people. So I would take all of them with me. Now, I would leave behind the people who work on the farms because they're going to make food. I can use the food, I can export the food, and I can tax the food, right? Because the empire is always taxing something. I would leave the people in the factories. I would leave the people that are doing all the accounting. But then I would leave behind some of my trusted people to run the thing that aren't going to foment rebellion. And I'd probably leave behind a pretty good military contingent just to make sure everybody remembers how we got where we got. So this is what happens, right? Amos says, if you don't, Because you haven't taken God seriously, the most comfortable of you are going to end up getting carried off someplace, and that's then going to be this chasm. Not that God created, but that we created all on our own. If we look around our world today, have we created any chasms? You can just nod your heads. Same ones, right? We also have halves, ridiculously halves, Maybe not ivory beds, but really nice beds and plenty of meat and wine and improvised singing and have-nots. We have a huge chasm between, in our politics, Democrat and Republican, but go find a different nation and it'll be between somebody and somebody else. We have chasms between um, classes and professions. and we, We have chasms everywhere. And God didn't create them. We did. In part because maybe we haven't taken God seriously when God said, Make sure you care for people who are poor and make sure you care for the orphans and the widows and the immigrants. And then you can go forward into all the stuff Jesus says. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you have an extra coat, give it away. If you're a tax collector, don't take more than you should. If you see somebody who's hungry, give them food. If they're naked, give them some clothes. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. If they're in prison, go visit them. Have any of you gone to visit anybody in prison? I have not. There are people who do, right? But that's one of those things that I have heard God say it and kind of been like, seriously? Right? Do we take God seriously? When we don't, 
I suspect is where we end up with these chasms between people and we create structures that ultimately aren't sustainable. Now, I'm not suggesting that the solution to this is to just add prayer back to school because we live in a multi-religious society and that's not the right thing, right? What I'm suggesting is if we care for people who are poor and orphans and widows and immigrants among us and all the other things that Jesus tells us to do, we just might find that we live in a different kind of space that is the real like life that God has intended us to have. And the thing is, we don't always get it right, but when we try to do that, it actually makes a difference. Every time you give us money to give away, every time we put someone up in a hotel for a couple of days, we have cared for someone who is homeless and allowed them a space of shelter, even just for a day or two to rest and shower. We've been able to keep people from becoming homeless. We've been able to help people get out of homelessness, right? All of that is part of what God calls us to do. And when we do it, we're taking God seriously. And when we don't, we don't. So I think both Jesus and Amos are encouraging us to take God seriously about these chasms of our own creation. But ultimately, we can't bridge the distance between us and God. There's always going to be times where we don't take seriously the, God's, the things that God calls us to do, because honestly, they're hard. And most of us are pretty comfortable. However, God takes us very seriously, so seriously that God joined us. That's the story of Christmas, right? God saying, all right, I'll just show up in the struggles that you have. And as Jesus, even as a little kid, did he get taken seriously all the time? No. They didn't know what to do with him, but it was hard to take him serious because he was little. And then as he walked around and did his ministry, there were those that couldn't take him seriously, and then there were those who took him very seriously as a threat. And they hung him on the cross. And on the cross, Jesus really just reaches out to us and to God and bridges that chasm that we have created and brings us together in that space of reconciliation. When we talk about baptism, we talk about communion, right? These are meant to remind us that Jesus has come into these chasms we have created, that God takes us so seriously that God is willing to join us and die with us and for us to take us to new places of life. So that when we think about taking God seriously, it's not because we're trying to close that chasm. That's already done. It's a response that we have to this gift of life that we have been given. Now, you might be thinking, Pastor, the rift between Democrats and Republicans, how are the however many of us are here today going to solve that? How are we going to solve the war between Russia and the Ukraine? How are we going to solve the poverty that's around us all the time? Because don't those problems seem overwhelming and enormous? Well, we can take God seriously, but let me ask this question. How many people did Jesus start with? Twelve. Amen. Amen. 